Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so we're going to be talking about test nets. But before we do that, there's a couple of resources, and because the internet might be a bit sketchy, we want to get you started early on downloading the documents. Um, there's a bunch of people from Kaposis around. You can also let them keep it. They can help you download the images faster. I have a hotspot or a USB. Uh, but the idea is once you get your laptop up, and we want to show you how you can go from ERP till I have something that is tested and I can get running. Yeah, we want to show you the entire pro uh, the entire prototyping process, as well as all the different components in a test net and what what happens. Um, yeah. Please make sure you download Docker if if you don't have it already. And uh, the is going to be pretty requirement for everything that we run right now. So you should be able to run Docker VM and possibly without to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and in case you're looking for any quick run commands, etc., you can go to notes.ethereum.org. So it's URL, um, ethpandaops slash protocol. And that should give you all the links and notes that you want. Uh, besides that one, there's also a GitHub repository with some quick run information. Um, we will be going through everything step by step. But I just want to showcase some things first so that you can already trigger the downloads. And then by the time we're actually at that step, we want to Okay. That being said, um, welcome. That's kind of awesome. Here we come. By the way, the presentation link requires permission. Ah. So, uh, before we start, let's do a little bit about us. So, I'm Pavito, and this is Barnabas. We both DevOps and at the Ethereum Foundation. And most of our daily life is working with Tesnax. Uh, and we mainly focus on the next update. So, right now, our day to day is full, um, and we're actually Probably towards the end, it's going to also get a part of our life. Uh, we have MEB support in Cancun starting from yesterday evening. We have tested it, so we're going to test it live with you guys and show you how the world works. Um, you can follow us both on GitHub or Twitter, uh, whichever you prefer, and our overarching organization is Panda Ops, uh, so you can find every tool, every repository, everything we talk about in that sort of uh, just to show you what you guys are going to expect today, uh, a little bit of background on test and stuff. We're going to talk to you about Proposis, which is a tool we use to orchestrate a lot of the tests. Uh, hands on on it, and then we're going to showcase all the testing uh, tools that we use, all the individual tools. And then we have questions and answers, and then uh, you can come to you. So hopefully, if you're at Proposis, you already know what the tool is, uh, but there is a chance if you're going to take a change in that. It's going to go through a quick walkthrough. Um, so Ethereum, um, is this is this okay? It's not blocking, right? Yeah. So uh, what Ethereum is, uh, the core protocol itself has the specifications, there's different parts, the decentralized network, you can run arbitrary computation on it. What it isn't, it's not a singular use DeFi application, it's not an NFT aggregator, it's not a programming language, it's not just layer tools. Ethereum is a superset of all of the things mentioned before. And how it looks like, uh, I didn't want to make a slide for tree Cancun because Cancun does change some things. Cancun is the next upgrade for Ethereum. So we're going to pretend as if for today's purpose, Cancun is already in. Um, so, Ethereum has two major parts. You have the execution and you have the consensus layer. Okay. So, the consensus layer is what takes care of what is right, what is truth on Ethereum. And the execution layer takes care of, okay, what can I do with Ethereum? The two layers communicate with each other via the engine API. Um, and you can individually interact with each of these layers via the RPC endpoints. Uh, so, from a regular user's perspective, you're almost never thinking about the consensus layer. So, whenever you get a balance, whenever you uh, submit a transaction, etc., you're almost always talking about the execution layer. So, the execution layer is a state, the transaction tool, the APM, 
and the consensus there is the DQ chain, the beacon space, who voted for what, what is the canonical like head of the chain, etc. Both of these two systems have their own individual beta PL network. Uh, so you have two times discovery, two times um, From the perspective of layer two, when you want to bundle up and submit your blobs, so that's the bundled up, rolled up, new uh, transaction type that we're introducing with Pinko, you would do so with the execution. It's a new transaction type, so you would just send the new transaction and they will show up in the network. These blobs, however, live on the consensus layer type, and for now, that's pretty much all you realistically need to know about Cancun and Tesla. So, what files are important? So, now you kind of have an idea of the three other uh, two layers. We have to configure these two layers, right? So, I'm going to go relatively quickly over the next two, three slides, but I do want to mention them because they can get quite deep. Um, and we want to keep the introduction to the final center only within three minutes. Um, so, the EL side. Um, unfortunately, the EL world has multiple standards in every day. Uh, same with Genesis files. So, we support essentially three types of this file, Genesis JSON. Uh, one for Bezel, one for Lattermind, one for uh, Git. Yeah. Uh, the Genesis JSON refers to the get one. Uh, if you see something with the term chain spec, it refers to the Lattermind one. And the basic one is usually just Genesis JSON again, but they have some tiny differences between. Uh, yeah. If you provide the get Genesis file to Bezel, it won't work. If you provide the get Genesis file to Lattermind, it won't work. We have that for the few with the nice tooling, such that you don't have to get. But if you do want to pair for something, that's where you want it. Um, the Genesis JSON file essentially defines what network I want, so the chain ID. For the consensus layer, if you can start, it needs a deposit contract and a deposit address. So what we do is we just take a, a storage code of the deposit contract and we put it in the consensus place. So when you start the network, the deposit contract already exists. You don't have to wait to start the network with the deployment. Two deposits, now that's not required anymore. Uh, we add a three map, so we have money to spend. We add when the network starts and when the network floats into different ports. Yeah. Um, the works itself are defined differently on the different files. Uh, so have, a, have an eye on that. So if you're using get or Bezu, uh, they would have something along the lines of uh, Cancun and Stan, and that would enable all the EIPs that are going to Cancun. If you go to Netherman, you have to enable or disable each individual EIP. So that's a, that's a fun thing to keep track of. Um, I mentioned the two layers, and they communicate over the engineer here. They use the J, they use a JWT token for authentication, and um, so you will essentially just toss it somewhere where both these uh, two components can be the same JWT token. Um, we you can see that um, there was a simple one that will work for every single client out there. Uh, we did have some early problems with, oh, one client pays for the new line doesn't exist, or one client expects the new rights in the beginning, etc. Just make it a little easier. But in the end, you can have your name as a separate Now, on the CR side of things, um, the CRL, thankfully, they started to do it. They were able to standardize a lot of things that they do. Um, so we have a config memory. Every single CRL needs a config memory, and that tells them what the network is supposed to look like. So that source can be found in the consensus space. This one is updated regularly, so you will always be able to find the latest um, config file that all the clients support over there. And this would include all the new parameters that were allowed to be configured. So, for example, yesterday we were at ACD, we had a new parameter that would be added that would limit the number of um, valid papers that can enter and that can enter the beacon chain. Um, and that value will be configured with like this location, it must clear as well. The config name, uh, you do actually have to set it because Prism, for example, would doesn't like it, uh, if you don't set it. Because by default, they will always assume that you're overriding mainnet values. But you're doing testing. You don't actually want to override mainnet. Um, and that would lead to 
some edge cases. So it's just better defined in complex and then they all import it as a new classical language. Um, min genesis active validator form. So that's the minimum number of deposits that need to be there before the network can actually start. For the real network, the 16,800, for all the test nets, we decide how many validators that we're going to have. This value is basically that. Then you will define when the network is technically earliest allowed to start. So even if you have enough deposit, you will still wait until this value before the network starts. And then you will add a delay to that. Um, and this delay is essentially when all the APIs would definitely work, uh, when peering is mostly happening on reason sometimes. Uh, so this delay period, we normally just give it one minute. You peer the networks will probably be the higher delay. Um, the Genesis 4 version, this is the state of the chain ID. So this value is what identifies the latent chain. Uh, it need, ideally, it needs to be unique because if you, uh, this, this is also used in deposits and in theory, you know, there's a lot of locations, so you ideally want it to be unique. Um, whatever port you're looking at, that also gets a port version. And when that port version happens, the, the nodes essentially change their theory to only uh, peer with people who are on the same port. Otherwise, your sharing messages that others do to And similar with that, we have our epoch, so that's when the fall is supposed to happen. Terminal portal difficulty, we needed this for the merge. Uh, for every network we're talking about, we just do merge checks. So the merge has already happened in the past. Right now, we're testing out and we'll probably be moving to propeller genesis. So that means withdrawals are enabled at genesis and you don't even post repeats. They're done in false and come up the So this one is going to go really fast through it. So you can mess with how quickly the chain progresses. So by default, I mean that it's 12. But we don't want to wait 12 seconds on test nets. We just drop it down all the way to 3. Sometimes we like it. Um, we, I think 9 is usually a safe value, so things are fair. Um, a couple of these values are relics of the one world. So how long the one block is, etc. We don't really need that. We can talk about it with the data. Um, and what else is important is the deposit chain ID. So the deposit chain ID is the same as the EL chain you're tracking. So this is essentially what makes the link between the EL and the CL. So you you know where the deposits are being tracked. Um, and then we have some blog related fields as well. So we're going to be playing around with these more often right now. Uh, so that we can do some stress testing, we can spy the logs earlier and so on. And that was just the config level, so that impacts on the network levels. But we still have a bunch of other files that exist in the folder. And this folder, we you can pass the entire folder as a as a yeah, as a flag to a lot of fans. And they just pick and choose which which file they need. This isn't really standardized because you can see you have deposit contract block. And then you have the deposit contract block hash. So Nimbus expects the hash, someone else expects the block hash. So that part still isn't standardized, but again, we have overarching tooling. We don't really have to care about this. The other one that's kind of interesting is the SSE file. Right? So the starting state of the VT chain, what we essentially do is we take the config YAML, um, you pretend as if all the deposits have been done, and then you generate a starting state. So you don't actually have to do the deposits anymore if you want to have a network with two million validators. Regularly, you would have had to start the EL, you would have had to do too many deposits, wait for all the things to work. But here we're just kind of pre computing everything and then passing that to the CL as, hey, why don't we just start with this? To do it easier and faster for us. And there's a bunch of pooling to go from SLZ, which we can't even readable, to a fast JSON value, so you can actually sanity check what values you have. Every client has, again, a different requirement. Best to just have all of these. We want to generate every single one. And useful tools for configuring all of these. So we have the Ethereum Genesis generator. Uh, essentially, it's a log file that wraps all the tools you need, and it gives you a single values or end file, which just allows you to configure what we think are things people might want to be messing with. So you can change where the form happens, you can change how quickly the blocks are, things like that. And then everything else just has the same thing. We have three different uh, release lines. 
So you have one that supports Vengeance Genesis, one that supports Capella Genesis by default, and one that supports Virgil Genesis. And Virgil Genesis is a bit trickier because you have to change which library version to use to be able to print those. Um, and then there's also an optional API you can enable. Useful if you're unloading Kubernetes. So you can just generate your files in Kubernetes, fetch the config files from the API, and it's really useful. This is what we use every single day. And the way we structure it is this is the root uh, source of truth for Genesis, and then a lot of tooling that we use just inherits this root source of truth. So when there's a change, for example, uh, merge needed to be added, we make sure it goes here first. And then once it's here, all of the dependent tooling can just inherit this update. They just have to update their version number, and then that's all you need to then do virtual genesis without any extra changes. Um, the tools that are in this exact one that people are interested in is, for example, the H2 Tesla Genesis one. That's from Program. We've been using it since forever. Um, it supports all types of network genesis um, that are available, and you can see kind of how that configures. Um, we've also added support for shadow forks there. So actually, a shadow fork, all the files required for a shadow fork would just be generated by this generator, as long as you add an RPC to get some data there. Uh, that's, a, that's largely our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. We have each two validators, which is great in case you guys want to generate a lot of validator keys. Um, I think if you want to use the deposit CLI, we did a test night with working by on many validators. It will probably take a couple of days to generate all of those keys, but each two variable supports the uh, insecure flag, which basically doesn't waste any hashes. And through that, you can toss it in a really fast machine and generate two plus million keys in under half an hour, which works beautifully. Yeah, and, and it's of course multi threading. So we have like this one fuzzy machine that has 256 calls, so you would <laughs> hashing and generating keys on all of these calls. It will do. Um, and ZCLI is really, really useful when you need to go between SSE and uh, when you want to go the JSON. JSON. Um, this is kind of our first check. So once we uh, have a definition for what the SSE is supposed to look for, uh, like in a network, uh, if the Genesis state is unparsable, there's no point starting the network. So we just pass it through ZCLI. And the reason ZCLI is again a source of truth is because this inherits all of its types from Z, Z, T, Y, T. Um, and Z, T, Y, T is just a source of truth for definition of what a network is supposed to, well, what the network is supposed to support to support for. Um, so if this one doesn't work, it will be sure the fans won't work. In terms of the testing stack, uh, how are we actually doing on time? Oh, okay. Cool. So, uh, our entire testing stack, everything basically inherits what you have seen earlier, and everything basically just configures what you've seen earlier. So, all the test runs, because we want to make sure that client teams are able to SSH in and are able to make whatever changes that they need to, we use Ansible. So we spin up a bunch of nodes with Terraform, and for those who are not familiar with Ansible, think of it like fancy scripting. Uh, that's essentially what it does. Extremely low level, very scalable. We run it on 400 node networks, and it works great. Um, we, if you want to have something that way, we help for us. We will show you what fork values, etc., you might need to tweak to make it a bit more performant. But by default, works great. Uh, we suggest using it for something. Like uh, 20 to 50 node was a good data. Um, we do also support Helen for everything. Um, so we have Helen charts even for the latest plan, so you can also run that on Ansible in Helen. Um, also, our uh, collections include not just Ethereum nodes, we also have things that are marked to have, where you can define Genesis as Ansible variables, and it just works great. Um, and then the approach we've chosen is a template test and approach. So if you were to go to get one, um, the template, the template test and people, this is pre-configured with the folder structure we expect, with the secret styles we expect, the tool styles we expect, and we use ASDF or tool management. So you can just run ASDF and then uh, or you can actually just run set up a message. It will download all the packages, it will make sure that you're using the right tool versions, it will make sure that your environment is basically set up how it should. 
eventually, I guess, we will be the next for this, but for now, yes, it's for this click. Um, it will also pre give you Terraform that you can use on digital version as well as Hexa. Um, it will give you the Ansible structure we need, and then Ansible generates the Helm structure you need. So everything is just automatically working, all you have to do is configure. And GitHub templates allow you to just, instead of having a fork it, you can just create a new uh, repository using this command. And this is exactly what we do for every single lesson. So, for example, uh, there's a new fork. Uh, it's being prototyped right now, it's called WIS, and WIS enables validator privacy. So you don't essentially know who is supposed to propose a block until after the plan is passed, so you can't take off that. Over the time, but that's essentially what's happening. Um, and what we did was we just go use them. Um, we modify the image versions, we modify where Genesis is supposed to happen, there's like a list of 10 things you have to change, and then you just run Ansible and you have a test net. It takes roughly 30 minutes to do this, and it's dropped down our toil in, in, insanely. Um, and we make sure that the template test net is up to date with the latest product. So any changes that happens, we make sure that the process goes up the same local in template. Uh, yeah. And in case you guys don't like the client team images, we have a each client document, document image builder. Um, if you're someone from the testing team, or if you're someone from the security team, or if you're someone who often wants to build stuff, um, let us know, we're happy to add you there. Um, mainly because there's, there's what, five, six consensus layer plans, five, six execution layer plans. Each of them has a different CI process. Some of them build images for branches, some of them only do trunk-based development, so you have to wait for stuff to merge into their account before, it, um, uh, before the image is built. Some of them don't like having a shell, which is hard if you want to do Kubernetes with init commands. Um, rather than dealing with 25 different things, we just thought, hey, why don't we build them ourselves? Um, and then we can also build uh, ARM as well as x86 images because the we like our Max. Um, and we want to be performant, I guess. Um, so we just do a lot of things that feel free to clone it, feel free to add your own beta there, let's do the beta. One thing that is nice to mention, and maybe nice for this room is that we have a tooling which is um, feel free to contribute to it, or if you see something there that you think you can build, just pick it up. Uh, we did actually have someone not too long ago um, pick up the library Beacon Chain Explorer. We, I think, have two or three versions of it out in the wire right now because we wanted to have it for testing and what's great. Um, there's a peer to peer monitoring tool that we're building. Um, this is extremely actively used for um, for figuring out what the log size of the network can have, figuring out uh, is are the latency is increasing, uh, figuring out uh, oh there's a transaction load increase, does that mean the block sizes are changing and what you can do a lot of analysis here. And this the other thing monitoring through Zara. Uh, collects all of the data and then shakes it out into a ClickHouse database. And then ClickHouse database is connected to Jupyter Notebooks, so you can write any sort of analyses you can. So if you've noticed stuff uh, from uh, Omar from the Rate team, uh, especially uh, Max DB, uh, he might have a few research posts. A lot of that data is generated from Powerful Exactly. Uh, and I think the Mega Labs guys made a presentation. They also use, if not some components of SATU, um, they at least build off of similar infrastructure to gather the data they need to make a presentation. So the idea is that we're also going to support the data analytics pipeline, and we're basically testing this on testnets and mainnet. And the idea is that we have this on every single test net, and we actually do for the big block tests uh, where we have 2.1 million validators. Uh, we ran up and that was our best insight into knowing, okay, how many bad data messages are there, uh, what sort of delays are we seeing, what sort of latency increases do we see, and so on. So we want to use this more and more in test nets, but towards the end stage of the test nets, so that you know that the network is stable, you know that it's stable against bundling, you know that it's in general good, and the thinking of pulling the trigger on the floor, 
That's when you would use this to figure out, okay, what optimization does they need. We have uh, library Beacon Chain Explorer from Beacon and Um And created with Beacon Chain Explorer, it, it's supposed to support a bunch of forks, right, in Genesis, and it doesn't cache any sort of validator objects. We, uh, we don't really care if a validator 0.1 ether two years ago uh, for retesting. All we want to know is who was supposed to propose, did they do their job, why not? And gather yeah, in some basic insight. Uh, he also has a proof of work faucet, which so far I think has been our only successful testnet faucet that does not get in safety trapped uh, and empty with no net. Uh, well picked, and Marius might, might be here, I don't know. He has a transaction puzzle. Transaction puzzle also supports block fuzzing right now, so by default, we um, spin that up and maybe fuzzing. And we have a metrics supporter because if you guys are in the DevOps and you run on every client, you will realize no client has the same metrics um, and it's awful. So that we, we actually tried getting them on the table and fix, fixing that, but at some point, we thought it's faster to just write a metrics So this works for every single client. Um, it'll use the RPC to collect data that we think makes sense. And if you want to add data fields there to get feed, um, we then have our own dashboard that give us a really nice overview on how it works actually. So, to join the public discussions, uh, eternity Discord is a great deal. Um, the privacy scale Discord page is another one, each research, you can check out a lot of the talks and the CD protocol. A uh, really good place for all of this. So, so far, I've just spoken about a lot of disparaging tooling and no way on how to coherently put it together, uh, other than the template as an example. So, when, so, there's two or three parts that we now so this one is being a background, and at this point, uh, you kind of know what the network parts are. You kind of have an idea of what sort of tools we use, and you kind of have an idea how they fit together. Uh, but now we want to actually get you guys using stuff. And before we get you guys using stuff, are there any questions at this stage? So I promise you yeah, all the tools will fit together. Um, and we'll show you how, it, how they fit together and we'll make sure that you can run it, fit them together. Um, but if you have questions at this stage, just raise your hand and we can talk about it. That sounds good. Just a show of hands, who knows what Docker is and who doesn't care? Okay. Uh, who knows and or has used Kubernetes? Okay. Oh, that's perfect. So we're going to do this in two ways. Um, so the first one is I'm going to tell you what the next three steps are. The next three steps are um, all the tooling that you've seen, we will be having a video probably next week or the week after that implements the um, template testnet repository and shows you all the changes that need to happen. Um, here in VR, all the changes can be found in the readme. Um, it's a really nice readme. It tells you adjust this variable, change this variable, and so on. It's like 10, 20 different commands. That's, it, it's not too bad in itself, as long as you kind of know. Uh, so we're going to do that off stream, mainly because when we attempted to do it ourselves and we were explaining each and every single thing, we realized we have to explain kind of all of this. So we kind of had to show people what is SOPS, we had to explain secret management, we had to explain Terraform, how do you manage infrastructure as code, what is ESDF, what are all the different tools, we had to get you guys PVP keys, and we had to get you tokens so that you can spin up the nodes yourself. It, honestly, even just documenting it took way too long. Um, I think it's not a format for an 80 minute uh, workshop. It's probably a format for a video, and uh, you guys can comment on that video. But that's only something we use on test tests. There's another tool that we use that's a really nice local testing tool. Uh, the way we work uh, for all of the ops is you have client teams, 
you have client teams that have uh, all the spec and they build a branch or an image that they think should be compatible with the new. So what we essentially recommend is cool is the happy and the SDT and they have Hive, which is a local test simulator. So you would put that image in there and the local test simulator will say, hey, you're not following the spec, hey, we tried this edge case, you have an edge page and so on. We essentially want the client teams to get that step down first or get so many positive results there that we're comfortable moving ahead. However, most of the hybrid tests are not necessarily interoperated, they're more related to edge cases. So then it comes the question, okay, how do we do interoperate tests? You have five years, five CLs, let's say all of them are actually ready. Um, I don't want to spend even half an hour setting up a test net, or some test nets cost money. Um, we don't want to do that. We just want to have something quickly that we can run locally, that will spin up all of these combinations, and tell us, is this going to break or not? Um, and that's where Kurtosis comes into the picture. So there's a... Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be in the like, common networks now. Um, so Kurtosis is, is, from a mental perspective, you can think of it like a middle one. Um, so Kurtosis would take a JSON file, it will pass it through the engine coordinator, and that engine coordinator will spit out information that either the Docker engine or the Kubernetes engine can use to spin up the net. Okay. Uh, they have a beautiful docs page, so you can just go Mm. I think there was an image somewhere, but it's, it's okay. So you can interact with it in a bunch of ways. Uh, from your perspective, it's just a simple JSON file, and that JSON file will end up as a test, which is magic, right? Uh, so this is an approach we used early on, and we were able to get a lot of bugs fixed. So the bugs that I'm kind of explaining are um, Prism expects this version hash in this format uh, under this condition that Nethermind did not. Or Prism and Nethermind was not even clear to guess because they both had different expectations of what the form ID is supposed to do. Or um, the moment that you try to produce a block, you're not able to because some part of that flow is broken. Um, so there's a lot of things there that relate to interrupt testing that would have wasted a lot of time for us, but we were just able to get through it over here. And then we also added a transaction fuzzle there, so all the basic sort of fuzzing issues that you would normally notice, like, hey, submit a transaction that has the wrong field, network already fails, because somehow it propagated as an invalid block on the network, you were already catching us, which is great. Um, and Kurtosis support the concept of a concrete dump. So it would just take everything related to the test net and dump it into a clean folder, and then you can take the JSON file, put that dump file, pass it on to the team, and then everything will realistically need to use that file. What can you use it for? Um, it's written in style, so you would interface with Protosis largely either via their code SDK or via um, the implementation which is style. I'll show you uh, what that looks like. So you can use it for anything you want to build. Um, one example where we're seeing a lot of uptake right now is people that want to try out MEV. Um, you might have a builder, and you might not know how to test if that builder works with MEV or the network. So what you will do is spin up a process, and then you will use the MEV as full, and then just overwrite the default image with your image, and suddenly you're able to test, test your builder. You're able to get requests that every single client is going to be sending you, and you know that you can handle. Um, and I'll let Barnabas take over from here for how the process goes out of the hood, and then we're going to uh, do a bit of uh, interactive work. But for that, we need to make sure that you guys can install it. Okay. Please make sure that you will start the process. Uh, you can install it. Uh, and please make sure that you clone this version. Okay. So that's kind of three things we need to have for sure. Um, 
Ya, Oke, okay. nah, um, there are a couple of again, the one that I have since the beginning of the talk. Um, if you are not able to download them fast enough, we are going to keep it as a conference and we are trying to let them all the most. Um, but the team here has Docker images in USB uh, drives, and I think there's also a way to fetch it from over uh, hotspot. Um, so we should be able to get it if it's somewhere. So because it's on the report, it's basically running either a Docker engine or a Kubernetes engine, so you can scale it up or scale it down as much as you want. And this allows you to uh, run a local test or run a uh, test on Kubernetes in any scale you want. And uh, that will be the most, I guess. Is everyone ready? Uh, if everyone has Crystal Skin install? Okay, I, I will ask this way. Who doesn't have Crystal Skin install? Oh, we can help out for anybody who doesn't. Yeah. You've been in trouble or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> You uh, you want to use some stuff? Well, I'm just finishing. I can't use. Doesn't matter. Can you can you use your own? Okay. 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 So if everyone has a consistency installed and they can verify that they're running version 0.8.2.4 and run a Google Fit engine install and they can verify that their engine is also running the same version. Raise your hand if you can get this. So the first, uh, first demo that we're going to do is the very basic, uh, very basic demo, which is running a uh, standard each network uh, package, which doesn't include any of our tooling. It only includes a lighthouse and the gap node, single node with 64 validators running. Uh, just right now. So if you run that one, I will uh, explain a bit more what you're doing here. So if you run a Kubernetes the wrong command, you will find where you want to grab the information uh, from. So in this case, we give off the bomb, that's put up with that, and each filter package. And then hopefully this will uh, build up a new main layer which is the structure that it doesn't have using. It will put all the images that it needs, and it will run the test network. So how quick is it start is it's uh, using the combination of the previous tooling that Pari has explained. And uh, here we can define how a participant looks like. So we have an EI client type, which can be any of the EI clients. We have defined it even for Red. 
we can specify an image by default it's going to use the latest uh, stable image and then we can uh, specify uh, the seal of that. It can be any of these seals. Or, and, and then you can define any of the images and you can test extra arguments or just leave everything default. We have uh, a few extra fields that we didn't list here, like uh, resource management is, is very good for uh, if you plan to run a like, larger cluster and you want automatic scaling in Kubernetes, then it's, uh, it's quite recommended to set your uh, resource request and resource limits to uh, higher than what we set as default, because the defaults are meant for 64 values per Yeah, yeah. So we just going to restart it because, yeah, the internet is not fair. But everyone should be able to run this command and hopefully eventually it will spin Yeah. So here we can see the process of uh, the Genesis uh, generator uh, generating the Genesis file for us. It's using this uh, the public contract address, number of validators in 64, using the mnemonic that is uh, predefined. And uh, you can override the number of uh, seconds per slot, slot per epoch. Uh, there are some minimum values that you have to respect where client team is just not going to work. But uh, the defaults here are within the default. So once, uh, once we declare that what kind of network parameters we want to use, then we can uh, start generating the validator keys. Uh, this is also now possible to do in parallel. So in, in Kubernetes, when you want to spin up, uh, I know, 100,000 keys yes. with 10 nodes, then you can spin up uh, 10 key generation for the 10 different nodes, and then each of them is going to generate 10,000 keys. This is uh, one process generating 100,000 keys. So this is, this is going to make everything a lot quicker. And uh, let's keep going. And here you can see the key stores. As I said, the default is a single lighthouse and guest node with uh, 64 validators. If, if we define more uh, in the, if we define more pairs, then you will see a lot more uh, nodes here later on. There's a little bit of extra uh, generation that's happening, and then here's the genesis file and the trust is set up. Uh, that is required for the demo testing. Here uh, you can see the Genesis files, uh, what Corey mentioned, the Gazoo, the Aragon, the Gas files, and the Nundermine Genesis files, they're all written into their respective directories. The... And here we have the CL Genesis file. So the CL Genesis file is set to the local time. So this is our local time. Uh, I think two minutes to it, so we have some time to actually set up the network. This two minutes might be a bit too short right now because of the internet connection, but the generally two minutes is that you know you spend up uh, maybe four or five minutes. And, and, and you can override this. You cannot override this. Sorry. So here is just uh, the Genesis file is actually being generated, and the first uh, EL is being spun up. So this is, uh, we, we do it in an order of spinning up an EL, then possibly a snooper, then a CL. So a snooper will be just a uh, uh, middleware software which releases all the uh, engine API calls from the CL to the EL. And we also look and we do a head check. So if any of these fail, the whole process is going to fail. So this is to ensure that every single time you run this command, is going to be 100% reproducible. And uh, you will get the same result every single time, even from different machines. So once the EL is spin up, then we go to the CL, and the CL in this case is going to be the light off node. We also do a uh, we, we pass all the default flags that Lighthouse requires, and here you can see the maximum CPU CPU is the default that we decided on for using this configuration, but everything is 
and you can go for the right one. Also, you might have noticed we have a lot of uh, testing debug specific uh, environments that's already built in. For example, Rust Bad Trace, make sure that you have things because if something breaks, the right must be nice. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, once we spin up this one pair, then uh, we will get a output of all the configuration and a, uh, a page where it will show that we have created an enclave, which is a random name, but this could be also predefined. But by default, the Docker spins up the name. And then uh, you will get the seal, lighthouse guest, and the EA get lighthouse and validator in a different process. And all of these ports will be automatically port forwarded to your local machine to a randomized port. So what you can do is you can actually see the random port, and if you do a, all right, yeah. you do that priority move. So let, let's say we want to get the E node or the ENR information from uh, Lighthouse, then what you could do is prepare your local host on this specific port, which is port forwarded from the Docker container port 4000 to uh, 6392, and then you can do a local host uh, curve with the API call that you want to do. So this will output everything that we did. What you can also do is see, uh, you can check the logs using the purchase this command. So that we can be a. Yeah, uh, these are the container logs. Which it says it has insufficient peers because there's only one node on the password. So it would probably make sense to actually change the default that these two nodes will be able to peer with each other. And if you were to just go to Docker PS, you can of course also get the Docker logs by copying out this command. As you can notice, the process can kind of up for you, so you can get to deal with it. But there's nothing overly fancy. Everything is still interactable by the Docker master. You can just do everything as you used to. Yeah, so exactly. So you can use Docker logs if you're more comfortable with that. And if you use the uh, currently, then you can interact with the enclaves using kubectl. So uh, when you use kubectl uh, in a Kubernetes setup, it will spin up a new namespace for kubectl. It will create uh, the enclave name as a namespace, and then it will place all the pods into that namespace. And this way, it's not going to interfere with any other work that you plan to do. Oh yeah, and uh, the screen, you basically wipe everything. Uh, list is not persistent, so whatever you run inside the enclave will be wiped from your disk once you shut it down. So this is really meant for local testing and local development for now. Uh, I know that they are planning to add persistence uh, in, the, in the future release to make it more production ready, but for now this is strictly meant for local testing and yeah. So uh, now I'm just going to switch and show you this example of how our day-to-day -day workflow looks like with this. Um, so we have the right house as well as the load star team and Teku, as you can see as Teku here. Um, both of them since yesterday night support MED with Teku. Um, Blackbox has a little alpha release for Med Boost that also supports Teku. And the testing team Mario built a mock builder that implements the MEV builder API specs. So we have all of these disparaging different tools, and we want to make sure that they work, right? So I'm going to just show you how we would do that. Um, and I've made some local changes. So I'm going to show you how that works when you're not fetching the process from, from bigger models. Are there any questions at this point? Was everyone able to spin up a basic and click and see it as make a local curve to the API? Yep. So before we go into that, that internet for the new keep that up, just okay. yeah, so here uh, let, let me go through quickly again this uh, JSON file. And um, you don't know that. Yeah. 
So here we can see it's a, it's a very straightforward JSON file where we uh, define import sequence. So in this case, it's going to use, again, a guest with a very specific image. So in this case, it's going to use uh, light line uh, one four or seven eight with this specific hash. And we, we build an image every hour for that uh, from the branch. For light line, we just use the uh, data which is uh, an image built by their team. And uh, here, uh, table, and we, yeah, and count is one, that means it's going to have one pair of them. And the next one is going to be, again, the same guest image with host star, uh, but for host star, uh, obviously a different image, with count of three. So this count of three means that we would like three instances of guest host star. So when you spin this up, you will have a total of node pairs, four pairs, sorry. And in the natural parameters, you can uh, specify the overrides. So by default, it will use 32 slots per epoch. But uh, we, we're going to keep using that. But what we want to do is reduce the uh, second per slot, because for, for this kind of test, we don't want to wait 12 seconds per slot, but six seconds will do. And we want to for that in epoch two. So that's also uh, over a our default. And for MEV configuration, we can also specify the MEV boost image that we would like to use. In this case, it's a very specific one again for uh, this test. And uh, launch additional services. So this is something we have not dived into just yet. But this is basically to build up all the tooling that we need, like transaction spammer, uh, block spammer, uh, the Lightweight detention explorer, which we decided to call Dora, or uh, yes, Dora. And we uh, have a super uh, that I mentioned over here. And then the next type in this case is um, mock, uh, I mean, so it's not a full long image. So just to again elaborate on the map type, we support two map types. So the first one is mock, which would use the earlier mentioned mock implementation of the API. But essentially, there's no real MEV happening, uh, but because it's a mock service, we can add some faults then. So we can say, return invalid payload for 25%, return uh, with a latency of 30 seconds after a short number of 5,000, whatever. We can do a lot of things with the mock mode, that's where we have it, and it's really fast. Uh, there's another mode we support though, which is full MEV, and that would spin up Builder, that would spit up Relay, the Relay API, the Relay website, literally everything that you would expect from MEV in mainnet. And it adds this tool called MapFlat. Uh, you might have also heard the last team mention it yesterday, all of that. Uh, so, what MapFlat does is it sees the builder with juicy MEV that the builder can then create. So, if someone wants to test out their builder, um, implementations for their strategies, that's a nice way to locally test it. Um, and the reason we have that is because MAV right now is a critical part of the network, maybe something percent of the network is there. Earlier we used to stick with the circuit paper testing, which is we make sure that the network will be healthy when MAV fails. We didn't have it, well, it's fine, we're still going to do that, but at this point we also don't want the network to just not fail, we also want it to be healthy to go for. So we're testing the entire map workflow early on, so we also don't get the feeling that, hey, we kind of have to wait another month because the relay images are delayed or whatever. So we're kind of helping it onboard on the impact of the attack so that we can all move a bit faster or earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you make it to relay or relay? Almost So there's a Mario from the testing team. Uh, from the EF who maintains a mock um, It's publicly available on GitHub, so GitHub, I think it's called the mock builder, but uh, it does a builder and create a thing. Uh, we don't have a plan, but we will eventually come back. Uh, but yeah, this is a mock builder, and you can mess with all of these uh, correct fields, and you can mess with potential invalidation plans. So you can mess with the types, or the attributes of the types can be invalid as well. And it's also a really cool project because for, I think this is really the first time we've really done that. It's technically something that used to be in Hyrule beforehand, but Mario put in the work to convert it into its own 
individual identity, and then it makes us interactive with the next job and nice data world. Uh, so now, rather than it being a standalone tool in China, it can be a standalone tool that we use in Um So we're kind of going with that approach more and more. So we have a standard tool that um, has its own Docker file, that has its own identity, and we can import that in Hive, we can use it in purposes, we can use it in Ansible, we can have it in uh, Kubernetes, and uh, rather than just a, rather than the two teams having to build the same thing. So, are you going to run this uh, mock MVP to all the tooling? Yeah, the other one is all the it's updated. Okay. So it's so fresh that the image has to be built right before the event uh, because <laughs> the previous one was not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up to date. So here you can see our entire workflow, basically from the uh, client Docker image builder, where we trigger a new workflow for a specific branch, which will then push an image. Uh, so here we can say that we want to uh, use an image. So this, so here we can run a new workflow where we want to use a source uh, repository. In this case, it's going to be upstream. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then a is the branch name. And it will automatically. Yeah, be like. Doesn't be like that. Doesn't matter. But here you can also override the tag if you want. But in the end, it will push everything to Docker Hub. And it will create a four or five images, one with uh, everything in it, with no hash included, for A and B and ARM. Then with a hash, so you can specify a specific build. Then it will release an AMD image specifically for AMD. If that for some reason your system cannot detect what kind of system you're in, you can specify that also. And for ARM, and many hashes also. So we would like to not demo this here because it will pull a bunch of images and it's probably going to to be very heavy on the internet if we try to run the uh, the additional tooling, but we will do a later on demo to run everything in Kubernetes, where we can provide you a Kubernetes backend where you can deploy whatever you want, and it's going to be a lot quicker because it's still pulling down. Yeah, just a big thing. So just a quick thing. Um, in case I wanted to target. Uh, so I've essentially cloned the HP package, and I've made, I think, one or two changes yesterday because I wanted to, and we didn't want to pay anything for the presentation today. So I don't want to target the remote repository. I want to target my local repository. And since it has the same structure, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. So instead of using the remote repository, you just use a dot, basically, from the repository that you are in. And then I'm specifying the JSON file that you mentioned earlier, and then that way I'm able to test exactly what I want to, and once I know it works, I could potentially push it on in front. Uh, and yeah, like Bartha said, we're going to be doing this with the Kubernetes version later on, but for now we're just going to leave it. The change, the change. So, let's see. Yes, it runs. Moment of truth, that we haven't run it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it says it's been I will run from the other Probably going to take a while, so uh, maybe we can. Um, maybe you guys can take a look into the Kubernetes setup in the meantime, in your local setup. We have some instructions in the note page. Uh, Thank you. 
first there and two that were good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 which is basically a config file for Kubernetes backend. If you download that and you set that as your Kubernetes, uh, then you should be able to start spinning anything up in this uh, in this Kubernetes cluster mm -hmm. using uh, the K8 configuration plan. So maybe if you just that can help you be up to speed with uh, how to move from here to Kubernetes. Back end for but basically this is it. So you have to navigate to your cryptosis uh, config file, and you have to change your Kubernetes uh, cluster to uh, Kubernetes or add your Kubernetes cluster to it. So just call it anything like uh, cloud type Kubernetes, and then add the config like uh, whatever you want to call your cluster and just leave everything else as a default. And once you do that, then you should be able to change to that cluster and spin everything up there. That's what you're doing now, or are we? Okay, so uh, if we do that, then I can do both of you a lot more. So in my case, my cluster is called the uh, KO cluster. Demo would be 
You can see that uh, the cluster is now being set. And now I'm probably going to restart the Kubernetes engine. So you can now see that the engine is running a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the numbers show that the Kubernetes cluster is now configured and the uh, engine uh, can be accessed with a new command called Kubernetes Gateway. So this will open a new service between the uh, Kubernetes configured uh, the Kubernetes engine and the local machine. So now that the gateway is running on the top, I can run the uh this run bit of the form of that and E2 package. So this E2 package includes all the tooling that we have mentioned before, and this is going to be a lot more telling. So hopefully this will uh, spin up all these pods now instead of the micro machine in, in the cloud. It will still just by default use a single guest light, uh, lighthouse uh, client, but it will add all the tooling that uh, it might need. As you can see, the chance is, is being generated right now. It will take a bit longer because it's actually talking to the Kubernetes engine. So every single port is being made to the cloud, and because of the small coupling that we have here, it's going to be a lot longer, actually. But shouldn't be that heavy on terms of pulling the images, because the images are not being pulled to my local machine, but they are being pulled to the uh, Kubernetes nodes itself. So is everyone able to follow what's happening? Apologies for the delay, but just stop the checking. Yeah, are there any questions? Is anyone from me that could look at this night to have? That's my question from the most design. Yes. 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 You need to have 64 validators. You don't need to, uh, but it's just it's probably the case. And because that aren't really still going to happen on mainnet, but on the system of the network, which you don't have that. But anyway. If you reduce your number of slots per apple, then you can also reduce your number of validators. So I think it's more to do eight than the more config. So then you decrease it to 16, which would be. But it doesn't really matter. Yeah. There's also one more part that we kind of glossed over when we talk about the config yammer. Um, so everything we're doing is with the main type config yammer. But if you go to the consensus specs, there's another version of everything called the minimal yammer. So the minimal yammer was initially meant to be testing, uh, tested, but so it allows, it takes a lot of shortcuts. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a few spec parts that it doesn't actually implement, and with that, 
much slot but you short slot times are much shorter than uh, second. You can do like one or two second slots and you can do a network with five second uh, uh, for epoch, five uh, slot for epoch and things like that. But when we try testing it out, not every time usable that often. So it ended up being messier than needed uh, for benefit that we ended up not really getting. Uh, I think it's more useful for the spec test, if you say that, but we don't really use it as a get network layer, and then the network layer you kind of want to emulate it, shows it about that. Yes, it's also the true do. Also, we are working right now in a way to call a set different number of validators per node, because currently what it's being used, when you create more nodes, then each of them will just be not 64. So, but ideally you want to be able to you know, set some nodes, not run any, any validators, or to run a lot more than another specific ones. So that way you can actually do uh, a lot of better distribution of the validators in the VR still. Should be merged, maybe model. Okay, so it looks like my demo is ready. So now we have, again, to recap, we have a Kutosis engine running uh, in Kubernetes, and we still have the port forwarding benefits thanks to the gateway. So the gateway allows us to have. Pretty much unlimited ports support forwarded, but technically this could break sometimes when you have too many ports. So there's some uh, some some stuff that might break. Yeah, lots of nodes. But you can see that we have a lot more extra cooling now. So we have the yeah port one that you might have seen already. The pretty big one. So the navigate to the. Uh, 1.2.0.1, you can see that we have the EL1 get lighthouse node with the foregone uh, port one. And the other one that's very nice is the light detention experiment that will actually show that you have all these more treatment slots and everything has been proposed nicely. And the first epoch is. Uh, Still getting there. You can see you have 64 validators, but again, if you open up a bigger network, you will have more validators. Maybe I can, I can show another test, uh, another test where we use more clients. We have an example of this in the world, which also. Yeah, yeah. So we've kind of spoken about two approaches for uh, using Pertosis. And also I just realized while talking about Pertosis for so long, I didn't mention uh, it is open source. Feel free to get around with it in any way you want. Um, we are just using it in one way, not the only way to use it. Uh, you can also use it if you just want to run a regular browser. Uh, Postgres database or anything. Uh, it's completely open source. You can mess with it. How are you? Um, there's a third way to actually interact with uh, the proposed engine itself, and that's via uh, Go SDK. Um, so the Go SDK, can you open the Go file? The Go SDK benefits because you can just run Go tests now, and you can define the test net as a background instance, and you are importing the proposed as well. Um, so this allows us to do a lot of cool things. So you can say, hey, name this one thing as finalization as Use this as the each two packets to that's the source of what the network is going to look like. Use these arguments to start the network. So you can say run one time lighthouse get, uh, run time, one time take to another time, whatever. And you can uh, make sure that it's And you can define everything. You can scroll all the way down. And with this, you can actually just wait until a while and check for finality the same way you would in every single go test. And in the background, the network is just running. And it gives you a kind of context that has all the information to interact with the log APIs. It has all the information for, uh, yeah, for, for the underlying 
instances. So the way we're kind of looking at this particular tool is you can immediately wrap it in the CI, you can immediately have updatable images, cross it in the CI and run nightly. So you can actually ensure that the interrupt between all the clients aren't breaking or there is master. Um, I'll, um, master main version of the is so this is just one small way we're using it. It's of course insanely powerful because you can do anything you can with both tests. Um, and you can also choose if you want to do this with the background or you can have a static stuff in the background and then just always run your test of the <laughs> Yeah, and we will definitely be doing a video and and there is a loop video which should be linked in this repository already. I think we're close to the end time, so we might not be able to watch it, but uh, maybe it's in notes. It should be soon. Um, yeah, otherwise, we'll make sure that the link for the video is on our presentation as well, so you can see like a minute as to how we are doing it. So you can make sure that you know the video, how that code test actually looks. Um, I'm just going to show you one more thing. Uh, so I'm just going to show you one more thing. And in case someone's already kind of feeling hungry or you're uh, angsty, there is some food over there, so you don't immediately have to run away to uh, grab your lunch. Uh, we do have some food over there. So this, uh, again, another cloud exchange. Uh, we're going back to the ABB example that I was mentioning earlier. So it's completely done. So you can see you have a star validator, you have uh, Log spanner on it, you have all the MEV tools containers, you have mock MEV, you have Snowball, that's basically a man in the middle, you have everything that you can need, and look, okay, there's a really a decent bunch of proposals, but that doesn't still mean anything, so let's do. So we're going to just look at the block MEV and we're going to follow the block. And you can actually see over here the block MEV service is actually getting um, requests from black beacon blocks and it's even responding to the beacon blocks. Um, so if we were to look at here, I'm mm -hmm. probably should have turned on debug logs. Um, but, when we go to see the information, okay, definitely we don't want too much information here, uh, but uh, the requests are actually showing up on our MEV. Uh, if you use the info log level, you can actually see the bit more. So this is essentially how we would end up testing uh, the methods working on the tanks. So we, we now have a network, we have uh, MEV boost set up, we have mock MEV delay set up, so, and once we give it on the time, we can actually assert that we have enough for the slots, uh, the builder is actually submitting the proposal, and we can make sure that that model works before we can do the change. Presentation. If there's any question, please let us know or let the people that they know. Join the Discord team, join our Discord team. It's uh, that's it. Thank you.